The bones of the thorax are the thoracic vertebrae, the 12 pairs of ribs, and the sternum. Connecting the upper 10 pairs of ribs to the sternum are the costal cartilages. The first rib is quite small. Like all the ribs, it's angled downward from back to front. We'll take a special look at the first rib in a little while. From the first rib to the third, the thorax widens in the shape of a dome to about two-thirds of its full width. From the third rib to the seventh, the thorax widens a little further in the shape of a cone. From the seventh rib to the twelfth, the thorax narrows slightly and the ribs become very much shorter. The sternum, commonly known as the breastbone, consists of three parts. The manubrium, the body, and the ziphoid process, or ziphisternum. The manubrium is attached to the body of the sternum by a cartilaginous joint, at which a little movement is possible. There's a slight angle between the manubrium and the body, the sternal angle, that's easy to palpate, as is the upper border of the manubrium. The costal cartilages form a series of flexible, springy links between the ribs and the sternum. The first costal cartilage articulates with the manubrium. The second one articulates with the joint between the manubrium and the body, and the third to the sixth or seventh costal cartilages articulate with the body. Here's what the costal cartilages look like in the living body. They're quite flexible. These are the costochondral junctions where the cartilages join the ribs. The lowest four costal cartilages, the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth, join onto one another in series, forming the costal arch. The angle between the two costal arches is called the infrasternal angle. The ziphoid process projects downwards in the infrasternal angle, where it can easily be palpated. The 11th and 12th ribs aren't attached to the costal arch. Since they're not linked to the sternum, they're called floating ribs. The ribs sternum and costal cartilages form an expandable container for the lungs and heart. This large opening, formed on each side by the costal arch and the last two ribs, is called the inferior or lower thoracic aperture. It's almost completely filled in by the diaphragm, which separates the thorax from the abdomen. The much smaller opening above that's formed by the manubrium, the first ribs, and the first thoracic vertebra is called the superior or upper thoracic aperture. Now that we've looked at the thorax as a whole, let's take a look at a typical rib, the sixth rib. The rib is thin and flat and curved in the form of a spiral. At the back, there are two thickenings, the head and the tubercle which are separated by the neck. The curvature of the rib is interrupted by this angle, which marks the insertion of the iliocostalis, a back muscle that we've seen already. At the front, the end of the rib is hollowed out for the attachment of the costal cartilage. The outer aspect of the rib is smoothly curved. Its inner aspect is marked on the underside by this groove, in which the intercostal vessels and nerve run. As we saw in the section on the spine, the rib articulates with the adjoining vertebrae at two points, the head and the tubercle. The head of the rib has two articular facets. The two facets articulate with the vertebral bodies above and below to form the costovertebral joint. This surface on the tubercle of the rib articulates with the tip of the transverse process to form the costotransverse joint.
These two joints are synovial joints. They permit the movements of the rib that occur in respiration. The joints between the ribs and the vertebrae are held together by ligaments. The strongest of these are the radiate ligament here and the superior costotransverse ligament here. The movement of the ribs is important in respiration, as we'll see later in this section. Next, we'll take a further look at the first rib, a landmark structure where the thorax becomes continuous with the neck. The first rib is the most tightly curved of all the ribs. It's also the broadest of the ribs. When seen from the side, its upper border lies in a plane that's about 30 degrees from the horizontal. In addition, when seen from in front, its flat upper surface slopes downwards, also at about 30 degrees. The costal cartilage of the first rib articulates with the manubrium of the sternum, not at the top, but lower down, at its broadest part. The first costal cartilage is short and massive. It hardly permits any movement, so the two first ribs, together with the manubrium, move up and down together as one solid arch. Here's a dissection of the manubrium and the two first ribs, with all the other ribs removed. Here's the movement these structures make when we take a deep breath in and out. At this point, the bones of the shoulder region, the clavicles, and the scapulae. Here's the clavicle, or collarbone. Here's the scapula, or shoulder blade. These two bones articulate with the bones of the thorax at one point only, here. The medial end of the clavicle articulates with the highest point on the manubrium, forming the sternoclavicular joint. It's easy to palpate the clavicle. Here's its medial end. The first rib is difficult to palpate. That's because it lies both below and behind the clavicle. And also because there's a thick layer of muscle in front of it. The lateral end of the clavicle articulates with this projection on the scapula, the acromion, forming the acromioclavicular joint. Apart from this one very movable bony attachment, the scapula is held onto the body entirely by muscles. It's thus capable of a wide range of movement, upward and downward, and also forward and backward around the chest wall. Here are the thoracic vertebrae and the ribs. Here's the head of the rib, the tubercle, the neck, and the angle. Here's the costovertebral joint and the costotransverse joint. Here are the costal cartilages. Here's the costal arch. Here's the sternum, the manubrium, the body, and the ziphoid process. The upper thoracic aperture, and the lower thoracic aperture. Here's the clavicle, the scapula, the sternoclavicular joint. The bodies of the thoracic vertebrae become progressively more massive from above down, as they do from the top to the bottom of the vertebral column. Each of the thoracic vertebrae articulates with a pair of ribs. On each side, the vertebra articulates with the rib at two points. Here, at the end of the transverse process, and here, where the pedicle meets the body. We'll be looking at the ribs in the second section of this tape. The transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae point sideways, the spinous processes point downwards, each one overlapping the one below. The articular processes are almost vertical. The upper ones face almost straight backwards. All amounts of 
forward flexion, lateral flexion, and perhaps surprisingly, rotation. <laughs>